Hello everyone, uh, my name is Kale, I'm the Jacobin video editor. Tonight we're asking, uh, how did the rich cause climate change? Um, it's a very big question, obviously. But the point is, is that actually not everyone on the left has the same answer to that question. And how we understand what is causing climate change actually has some pretty significant effects on what to do about it. And so uh, this is a new format that we're kind of trying out for Jacobin Talks. Uh, instead of our uh, previous uh, format where we bring on uh, an author, a writer, um, an intellectual, uh, an activist to give a lecture, what we're going to try to do is actually feature some of our authors uh, that are being published regularly. So. I thought it'd be a great idea to actually bring on um, a friend of mine, uh, an author, Matt Huber, who recently wrote a piece uh, just the other day in Jacobin called Rich People Are Fueling Climate Catastrophe, but not mostly because of their consumption. He also recently wrote a piece for us in Catalyst, our uh, sister journal, uh, titled Still No Shortcuts for Climate Change. And both of these are very much worth checking out. Uh, especially if you care about the future of our planet. So, uh, Matt, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Um, so I think we should just start with uh, what the article is about, um, kind of what the, the, the immediate um, kind of thesis of why you're writing this piece. Um, and before we get to that, though, I do want to say, if you're watching this, please hit like, please hit subscribe. Please share. Doing this all out of order, but um, and and we'll try to take some some questions from the uh, the live chat towards the end. But it's gonna be a little bit of a stream than typical. Um, but back to to you, Matt. Of course, that so there's a, some new research that have, that's come out uh, recently um, that does solidify uh, our understanding that the rich are in fact driving climate catastrophe. Um, but you have a different analysis than uh, well than a lot of other people who are, who are writing <laughs> about climate change, but even even the people writing this this piece. So um, I'll, I'll throw it to you. How how should we understand this new research coming out? Yeah, I wouldn't even describe it as new research. It's more like an onslaught of research that's been going for the last five or six years or so. And um, uh, I think that one of the first reports I cite is Oxfam uh, released an analysis called Extreme Carbon Inequality that found in there's this this sort of iconic graph um, or sort of chart where they show that the, the top 10% um, of the income uh, distribution is responsible for 50% of global emissions um, and the bottom 50% is responsible for a measly 10%. But um, as you can see, um, if you put that back up, sorry, uh, you know, the, the description is associated lifestyle consumption emissions. And this is kind of the modality through which this research is often analyzed. And um, other scholars familiar probably to Jacobin readers is Thomas Piketty and others who basically analyze income inequality like this Oxfam report to show that the, the highest income earners are responsible for the most emissions. Now, what this assumes is that really the, you know, the people that have high incomes then take their income and spend it on consumer goods, which include things that involve emissions like driving SUVs or taking flights or eating meat. And these sorts of, as we know, um, consumptive activities that are really uh, linked to high emissions, um, either directly, like when you're driving a car, or in the kind of life cycle. In the case of meat, we know, you know, when we eat the meat, it's not exactly you're seeing the emissions, but the the whole, you know, life cycles production of meat is really emission intensive, particularly red meat. Um, so, out of that, like 2015, then there's just been study after study that really says what we should agree with, which is the rich 
are causing climate change. Um, and it's because of their affluence. It's because of their high consumption activity. And, and this kind of, you know, it, it, it kind of makes, again, these assumptions that emissions themselves are attached to individuals. <laughs> like when you are an individual consumer, you are responsible for 100% of the emissions attached to that activity. Um, but as we socialists know and Jackman readers know, consumers are not really the only actors in a capitalist economy. You know, so um, the example I give in the piece is if, if we're taking a flight, um, you know, there are emissions involved with that flight, but, but we're just the consumer of that flight. We're trying to get to some place. There are other actors in that relationship who sell us the flight uh, called the airline or and, and the innumerable other capitalist enterprises uh, that are contracted by the airline whose, whose goal is to um, make money, make profit off of this transaction. And so what I'm trying to point out is that all this data and all this analysis places 100% of emissions and responsibility on the consumers of meat or uh, SUVs or, you know, the oil in the SUVs or the flights. But, um, you know, those emissions shouldn't be only the consumers. They should be, um, you know, we should also blame and hold responsible all the for-profit capitalist actors that provision that consumption. And, and, and really, you know, I'm not saying, you know, we should, we shouldn't say, you know, I want to make clear that like, a rich person that that does this kind of egregious, wasteful consumption is not great. It's not good, um, but it's 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 they're not the only one involved in that relationship. And the only way we can really blame them 100 percent is if we subscribe to a really like neoliberal economic um, theory, which says that consumers are the ones who really drive the economy as a whole. Like, and that's like neoliberal market orthodoxy, that like consumers, their choices are really the one, that's the market, that's what's driving all the production decisions. And capitalists are just sort of, you know, they're just sort of helplessly responding to the market, responding to demand. But of course, us uh, socialists, we, we take a different view of the economy. We think it's the people that own the means of production, that control production for profit, are the ones that have the real power in the economy. And so again, in that airline example, shouldn't that airline get a good chunk of responsibility for those emissions? Right. I think there's there's almost two problems going on mm -hmm. with part of this analysis. Well, maybe there's more than two, but I'm thinking of two right now. The first is that uh, it's right. The, it kind of abstracts away from capitalism as a real, actual set of social relations. Like obviously. Capitalism is an abstraction, but it's a real abstraction that we actually do have to live our lives by. And so just saying that, well, everything's kind of just decided by what uh, what people on the market want to do or what they want, that it's just kind of the, you know, collection of a bunch of people making decisions in, in a void uh, is not at all how society actually works, that there, there actually are real social relations that again, do determine what kinds of choices people actually have and, and what they have to make. Um, and so as consumers, most consumers um, are also workers and most workers uh, get their income comes from a wage uh, yeah. that comes from their boss, which comes from the fact that they are an owner of a company yes. that is trying to maximize profit. And yes. all of that is just taken out of the equation and it just says, well, bad outcomes happen because uh, you made bad choices on the market, right? Absolutely, yeah. So this is, I call it like an ideological trick of capitalism where it's, you know, we feel, we actually do feel free in the market. You know, we are free to choose, you know, like a lollipop or starburst or whatever, whatever candy. And, 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 and that's in a capitalist system in the marketplace, we do have this agency and this choice and this freedom. Um, so that's why I think a lot of people get hung up on the, on these consumption based choices, because it is this place where people have agency, you know, even if you're rich, you don't have to have a Hummer. You don't have to fly around the world. You know, you do have choices. And, and, and that's, that's, 
that's part of the 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 the, the kind of ideological celebration of capitalism that neoliberals and pro market people want to really emphasize. But the the thing it doesn't it doesn't tell us about is that there is this background. Um, there is this uh, uh, this this zone of production where it's there is no freedom. You know, if, if you're a worker, especially if you're a wage worker, you have to work under the dictatorship of the boss. You have you have no choice. You know, if your boss is engaging in carbon intensive, wasteful uh, production, you know, you can be like, hey, climate change matters. And he'll be like, shut up, <laughs> you know, get back to work. Like and so there's this whole zone of for profit, private control of production that is there it's just there's no choice right these even capitalists you know marx is very keen to point out that even capitalists are co constrained by the forces of competition by the structural imperatives of accumulation and and they are really forced to kind of compete or die and accumulate or die and and so in the zone of production um there's not a lot of choice and it's sort of subject to these dictates but when you start to look at the climate problem, you start to realize like actually it's these these this part of the economy, production, and, and these people that own it and control it and profit from it that are actually contributing the most to the emissions, to the climate problem um, in particular. If you want to show the IPCC graph, you know, just on a very basic level, and this doesn't quite get to everything. But, you know, in, a, in an old school Marxist sense, the kind of what we call production is the industrial sector. And as you can see, these are global emissions at a global level. This, this is not quite true in the United States, which is to some extent deindustrialized. But globally, we still have a lot of industry, right? We have a lot of production of stuff materially. And as you can see, um, in they separate this in direct emissions and indirect refers to the emissions that these sectors use from basically electricity consumption. But as you can see in the direct industries, you know, right there at top 21%. Um, uh, but if you go, well, it's below what is called um, ag agricultural forestry land use change. But if you go to the indirect, you see again, industry at 11%, a huge amount. And, and so what this means is that industry is about 32% in total of global emissions, about a third, and it, and it dwarfs buildings, transport combined. And so this is, this is the kind of the, um, the kind of core of the climate crisis, you know, steel production, cement, you know, steel and cement are estimated to like together constitute about 15% of global emissions alone the chemical sector um the and, and and not to mention the production of all the material stuff that consumers so-called enjoy so like if you have an iphone you know should you be responsible for all the emissions in that iphone or should timothy cook and the apple corporation be responsible so these are the you know like um looking at production gets you to kind of think about who has the power in the system and who should really be held responsible who should we target um, politically in this scenario. Right. The, the, the iPhone or, or any, any, um, you know, uh, consumer item being produced mm -hmm. in a way that it's, it has no consideration or little to no considerations for the environmental impact. It's almost entirely determined by what someone can get away with on a market and who's going to make the most profit out of it. And so yes. those who sometimes this is something I've heard Lee Phillip make this point many times, but, um, and he's not the first to make it, of course. But the fact is, is that, uh, you know, if you are in competition as a maker of some of, some, of an iPhone, and um, let's say there's maybe not the best example, because it's like a, <laughs> it's an Apple product, but um, f cell phones um, that you're, you're it's one cell phone company against another cell phone company and in the, in the cell phone company that decides we're going to pollute less. We're going to be more environmentally friendly with our construction, yeah. with our distribution. Um, if that, in fact, does drive up costs, then they are most likely going to lose in the market mm -hmm. and because they can't uh, outcompete their competitors who are doing all of these really yes. horrible practices. Yes. And so it's not even it's not even like a associate. It's, it's not a, um, a psychological problem. It's not yes. that the, the boss is. Yes. just a really bad person it's not yes. that they 
yeah. want a bad outcome or maybe they do want a good outcome. There's every company like ExxonMobil is telling us that we need to be uh, we need to reduce our carbon emissions by 2050. And it's like, OK, I'm sure I'm you know what? I'm willing to say that people, the CEOs of ExxonMobil believe that. Yeah. Sure. Why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take I'll take their word for it. But yeah. it doesn't matter because it, it because ultimately the decisions of the company don't hinge on the CEO's particular feelings on an issue. It largely depends on, are we going to recoup a profit for our shareholders? Right. So that's where I think this is the, the kind of the, the real crux of this. And this is kind of the, I think the importance of this piece. It's, it's this question of, even if you accept the fact that most working people are in fact dependent on markets for their lives, that we all have to go to markets in order to get the things we need to live. So we buy our food at supermarkets, we buy our clothing mm -hmm. from stores, we, you know, we rent, most of us rent from landlords. Um, even if you accept that, and you accept also that, um, you know, people who own businesses are also consumers, they produce, mm -hmm. but they also consume. Mm -hmm. So why are we then, why can't we just consume our way out of this problem? Why can't we, why couldn't we then at a mass scale say, let's consume differently mm -hmm. and let's influence the market by saying, we are all going to start uh, purchasing beyond burgers <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> or, or, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, or okay, maybe more dramatic. We're gonna become vegans. We're going to, um, you know, change the, the kinds of, uh, products that we buy that that in fact do have uh, a better carbon footprint why could it why shouldn't the left be organizing to get people to change their mind and change their consumer habits <laughs> it, i mean they can and it's it's fine it's <laughs> it's it's it, it's it can be you know i always say it can be like educational to kind of talk about and, and, and honestly, like if I'm focused on production, it's it's useful to talk to people about their consumption and how it links back to these productive resources and, and, and emissions. Um, you know, it's just like, I think when you look at the climate problem, it's it's clear it's a, it's a, it's a problem of power. You know, we have these capitalist firms that have a stranglehold over our energy system. And essentially we have to like wrestle the power away from that class to kind of create a more, um, you know, you know, create more, uh, say control over our energy system to really push it to decarbonize at the scale and speed that's required. And so it's just like, historically, if you want to look at, um, examples of where you have an entrenched power interest that needs to be overcome, you don't typically see it overcome rapidly and fast with just sort of natural consumer market processes, right? It has to be kind of mass movements that that kind of create the kind of pressure that can really force uh, change at the top and, and that can build that kind of power. Um, and the other thing, if I can just slightly diverge is just, you know, when we when we look at people, even rich people who, like you said, they rely on the market too for their lives, right? They consume um, to get, you know, to drive to work, to to get the food they need, just like uh, the working class. And but the thing I also try to emphasize in the piece is that if you look at a rich person, um, why do you only focus on what they do outside of their workplace or their ownership place, if you will, uh, for their responsible responsibility for climate change. So again, the example I give is if you have an airline CEO that spends eight to 12 hours a day, you know, managing a fleet of 10,000 planes and, you know, these planes emit hundreds of millions of tons a year. And, and that's what they do most of their day. Right. Um, and yet mm -hmm. they spend a couple hours commuting in an SUV and eating a steak at night. But yet those two tiny things they do, for only two hours, get all the attention and focus and analysis on the on the emissions and the carbon footprint and the and and the polluter elite, but we just don't hold them responsible for what they do in their productive sphere and their in the work sphere and and that actually has way more consequence. And these as egregious as their consumption actions are, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what they're doing 
managing a chemical chemical corporation or an airline corporation. And so we really need to start focusing politically on those those um, those wealthy people, the people that are actually owners and controlling the the productive resources of our society. We need to build movements to take on their power um, and not just because a lot of this research is essentially it's just saying, listen, rich people, you're over consuming, you're you're consuming too much, you're destroying the planet. You need to you need to scale down. You need to consume less meat, and you know that's that's fine, but we really we don't want to ask them nicely to consume that less. We need to like build the kind of power that forces them um, to, uh, that basically allows us as a society to make these uh, decisions on our energy system so that we can actually like create a livable planet for everyone that is not owners of energy corporations. Right. So that it, it seems the, the consciousness raising strategy is is not gonna get very far um and you know but it, it's like you're saying it, it's it's not it's not nothing but um and it, it's there are in fact aspects of this like there are different consumer choices that probably are worth making sure um but that's not going to stop climate change because it's just so the in here between like the consumption habits and the the necessities of production in competition on markets. Yeah. So, cause then someone like Bill Gates, for instance, uh, he's been saying, you know, he's, he's someone who is regularly, you know, I'll, I'm gonna give him some space and some time right now while he and Melinda are, are working through their, <laughs> their marital issues, but- God speed to um, them, I hope they can work. <laughs> I'll, yeah, ho hope it goes well. I hope I hope they both live really happy lives, maybe separately now. So, um, but because you know he's been saying that uh, he too wants you know we he thinks that we need to be doing something about climate change. That he thinks that we need to be we you know we can't go over the two uh, two degree Celsius increase by twenty fifty. Um, and his solution to all of this is a technological fix. That the way out of this is. Um, well, the way out of it is invest in his new products <laughs> that he's producing in order to, to deal with climate change. Um, or, you know, he, he is an investor. But how, um, uh, so I guess, so just to cover all bases, like how do we now, and maybe we're just re reiterating ourselves, but how do we now deal with the, the technological argument that, um, you know, we can just innovate our way out of cl uh, the climate catastrophe? Well, kind of like the consumer argument, it's like we we're waiting, right? <laughs> we're, we're, you know, one of the most amazing statistics to look at is the global share of final energy consumption that is percentage fossil fuel consumption. And if you look at it, it's basically static. It's 80%. <laughs> it's been 80% since the 1990s, and it's still 80%. And um, it's just, you know, we have a lot of uh, exciting breakthroughs in clean energy, but it's just not happening fast enough. And the other thing about Bill Gates, uh, I've, I haven't read the book yet, but um, from what I've read, from what I've read, he's really framing this like so many elites in the past that he calls it, I think he calls it green premiums, where it's essentially like to go green, it's going to cost a lot, you know, it's going to be really costly, it's going to be hard, and we're going to have to initiate these green premiums. And the question is, who's going to pay for the green premiums? And this is an old kind of very technocratic way of, of saying climate change is costly, it's it's going to cost a lot to deal with, and it's going to be bad and sacrifice. Um, and um, what that communicates to the majority of people is that, which most people, I think, the majority of people think this way. They think climate change is about horrific disaster and and and, and terrible cost. And, and if they live in a country like France where Macron is like implementing like carbon taxes that say, well, you know, we all have to pay a little more because of climate change, people, you know, that's what they see. They see costs are going up because of climate change. But that's not, doesn't have to be the case. Again, you know, like the to me, at least the genius of the kind of Green New Deal um, that AOC and others sort of articulate was that actually, if we attack the power of the people preventing this transition, we can actually build an economy that um, actually 
is less costly for the masses of people that offers them cheaper electricity or cheaper public transit or uh, you know public housing like we can actually build a decarbonized economy that actually is not more costly for you it's actually better it's going to make your life better it's going to it's going to cost less and it's going to you know it's it's actually we have to make it cost more for them but for us for the masses it's going to be really great um so that i think that is what we have to keep hammering home that when billionaires like bill gates say well there are these green premiums it's going to be really costly we just have to call bs on that and we have to say no we can we can if we actually have uh, control over this energy system we can actually build it to be um to work for the masses of people right and it also stresses the importance i think of uh, like when we're when we're thinking about policy like we have to be the the financing of this is going to be coming from all capitalists right that it's so bill gates might be right just on paper when he looks at you know his expenses and say i can't afford a tax increase uh because it's you know it's going to to hit me and i think as a capitalist as someone who is concerned about reproducing himself on a market as a as a competitor objectively he might be correct that this like a certain raise in taxes might make him uncompetitive uh as an individual but the point is that we're we would do something across the board that we are actually altering like what it means to be profitable or to be competitive that, that when we inter we um universal in, in the sense of universal capitalist uh sanctions and taxation and and um uh you know so i think this is the other this is kind of one of the things that capitalists are not going to do that themselves bill yes. gates and, and other corporations are not going to be the one to to mess with profitability to mess yes. with um regulations yes. um and like you're saying it, it necessarily means that um maybe not necessarily but what we know from history looking back to when we have been successful at curtailing the power of business it did come through labor movements and labor parties and working people fighting back um so this is i, I wanted to jump to because i i, I want to wrap in a little bit because yeah. trying to keep these a little shorter but um there's a question that i want to get from the audience actually but before that i wanted to jump to uh this question of professionals and of course the people who are writing these um these research papers the people who are analyzing this uh the academics who make um you know careers and uh, get tenure out of talking about these things <laughs> so much of it um you know they they end up the the consumer uh strategy to deal with climate change is very attractive in their eyes um and maybe if you want to talk a little bit about why it's so attractive um and how do we kind of disaggregate on the one hand obviously people who have uh certain professional knowledge on a topic oftentimes it is important um to listen to them and to to consider at least con to consider like what scientists are saying about um climate change and to um I don't mean because obviously we believe climate change is real, but but the point is that like when when new information is coming out, um, we you know it's important just kind of normatively to to consider people who have credentials on these things because um, yeah. they've been doing the research and it's hopefully if they're doing their jobs well saving us a lot of time so that we don't end up having to to do all this research. But they also are members of a class and they have mm -hmm. their own particular interests. Um, so maybe if you could help us kind of disaggregate this, like to, to what extent do we listen to the intellectuals and the professionals on climate change? Well, that's a, a key point. I mean, all these studies are being produced by, you know, scientists and academics that come from this kind of professional class. And to me, the, this professional class is kind of sort of stuck in these, all these kind of contradictions, you know, that, you know, the sort of the, the whole basis of being a professional is is trying to get these credentials to get you into the labor market to give you some semblance of job security and and economic security, um, and and that you know uh, is is often the economic goal. But if you are to achieve that, if you get tenure, if you 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 actually then 
find yourself in this kind of middle class consumption livelihood system <laughs> where where because especially if you're a climate scientist or if you're at all following the science on climate change and you're concerned about it you start to feel like this is a horrible contradiction here that i'm living this uh what we call bougie middle class <laughs> existence and 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 the world is burning and but the problem is they start to think that they themselves are the main cause <laughs> of climate change because they're so kind of beset by this anxiety which i gotta tell you this is like autobiographical i've gone through this you know this 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 kind of anxiety of being a participant in this in this um in this uh emission system let's say and so um so i think then when they're doing this kind of research it kind of makes sense like i'm trying to like scale down i'm trying to consume less like have a lower carbon lifestyle I'm trying to do these things. So obviously the solution on a larger scale is if, if these rich people who aren't doing that could do that as well. And if we could force those rich people to live like me, the kind of, you know, like I'm driving the Prius, I'm not eating meat, I'm curtailing my flights. Let's make the rich do it like I'm doing it, which makes a lot of sense from, from their professional class perspective. But again, again, I would just say these people are not the cause of climate change. These are not the polluter elite. It's the people who really control the, the energy system, the production system, like I was mentioning before, steel, chemicals. These are the people we need to target. Um, and um, I think sometimes the professionals kind of be a, a little self-involved, <laughs> a little self-focused and think it's all about them, but it's actually not. And what I think we can do best, um, or at least what I would as one of these people, you know, is to try to actually get involved in these larger movements, right? To participate in building the kind of power and political movements that can take on the class of people that's really responsible for this problem in the first place. Right, totally. So actually, so on the on this um, topic of industry and, and most of uh, pollution coming from um, industrial sectors, there's actually, there's a question I want to pull up and I, you've probably, I think you have answered something like this before, maybe in a previous video we've done with you, but I think it's worth kind of addressing this again, because this, this becomes a, a persistent, um, just, just an aspect of kind of the left critique of, uh, climate change and of, um, not of climate change, but of the rich, uh, creating climate change and, um, kind of, uh, again, this question of who's really responsible. Um, because, uh, here we go. This commenter asks, um, can you, Matt, talk about the differences between rich and poor people in the U.S. as compared to the difference between rich and poor countries? Um, and so this is the, one of the kind of the framing that sometimes has come out. And I think it's changed somewhat over the past few years, um, as I, I really do think that, uh, the Green New Deal framework and, and what AOC and, and, um, other important, uh, activist groups, whether it be Sunrise or DSI or others, I think we have made some progress in our framing of what what is driving climate change. That um, and we are doing a better job of kind of identifying the enemy um, and, uh, and and the causal mechanisms. So both capitalism and capitalists, but also the imperatives of markets. And um, but this this question of you know rich versus poor countries and um, you know, increasingly over the last few decades, more and more emissions have been coming out of the global south, for instance, as as they've been industrializing. And mm -hmm. um, so, how do we how do we think about this on a global scale? And and again, this this question of rich countries versus rich people or a rich class um, versus the poor. There's a lot to get into there. One quick thing I'll say is that oftentimes. People will say, well, the industry moved to China and they're just producing the consumer stuff for us in the rich countries and we're consuming those emissions. So like, again, the emissions are the consumers um, and it's not China's fault. They're just industrializing. But again, that analysis just leaves out the owners of the corporations that are, you know, some of them are like General Motors or Apple or Walmart that are investing 
in the production uh, system and the supply chains in China, and they're making all the profit off these supply chains. Um, but I think the other, I really get a little frustrated with a lot of environmentalists who, who want to talk about rich countries as this as this this kind of monolithic entity where everyone in the rich country is really um you know destroying the earth and and so forth because in a country like the united states you know um one of the stats i've been uh i've come across lately is like 70 percent of people in the u.s have like a thousand bucks in the bank you know you've probably heard the the, the 40 percent have could not pay for a four a four hundred dollar emergency and so I think again, that was before COVID. That was before COVID, and now you have the devastation of COVID. You have people lining up in food lines and food banks. So there's so much material deprivation. People aren't able to get the healthcare they need, the the food they need in this rich country. <laughs> um, and so it's true. Like probably the top twenty percent of the United States is is doing well and could do and could do with a little less well it could do with a lot less and that's kind of a, you know a socialist would want to tax that top 20 percent at a higher level and um but again if 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 we're gonna win over and build the kind of power we can't just say these rich countries are exploiting the world and you know expro appropriating the value from china but it's not the rich countries it's the rich capitalists and the owners and the wealthy people who make up very very top um uh sliver of of the class structure who really are benefiting from this and for most people you know um it over especially over the last 40 years life is just getting harder and and more economically insecure over time and so to actually speak to the the masses of people even in a rich country you have to they learn this in france even uh you have to kind of you have to kind of be like i'm gonna we can actually solve climate change by by actually improving your life materially and that that has to be the solution and that gets lost with the whole category of rich country right i, I think that's totally right um this is but you know whether it's rich country or just um kind of like the al gore framing of you know it's climate change is man-made period it's just it's right. just all of human humanity has just yes. caused this and of course it's not humanity yes. and it's a sliver of humanity within a particular social and economic context that are that that exist in a different um again to make it a little marxian like they their entire world their entire life like how they exist in the world is completely different than the vast majority of us because they are solely focused on maximizing profit, whereas the rest of us, um, we buy things, we sell our ability to work, maybe we sell other little things here and there, we might, you know, have little Etsy shops and things. But for yeah. the most part, most of us are just kind of trading goods yeah. around, yeah. Or, or trading money for goods or goods for money. Whereas yes. capitalists are constantly trying to maximize the amount of money that they end up making at the end of the day or at the end of the week, the end of the month. So it's, they, they just have, and it's not a psychological thing. Um, uh, I mean, it is, but it's not, it doesn't start as a psychological thing. It's, it's a market imperative that just completely consumes their lives. Yeah. This is a point out. And this is one of the things is like, we don't see capitalists that often. <laughs> we don't see these productive enterprises. They're, they're, they're off limits to us. And so our our only experience is, is that stuff sort of reproducing our lives and appropriating what Marx called use value. Like we're just trying to fulfill our needs. So, but capitalists are not like you and me. They they have not just a psychological but a structural com compulsion to have to make profit and reinvest it and compete and make more profit. And that is not an experience that many people see see in their lives or understand or or even know exists. So, right. but yet those people are the ones that have all the power and control everything. And one of the one of the the, the issues is even if you go back to that Oxfam graph, I mean they, they say the top ten percent of humanity is responsible for this fifty percent of the emissions. But like you know, if we're looking at actually the ownership class, the capitalist class, it's it's a lot less than ten percent actually. If we really want to look at the owners 
And so we can each, we can even be more radical and more kind of give a kind of a progressive analysis of of the inequality if we actually focus on the owners, the people that actually control and profit from these systems and aren't just trying to get by, fulfill our needs and 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 survive in a really alienating and soul crushing capitalist system. So well, on that note, <laughs> Um, I do want to encourage everyone to read the article that this talk is more or less based on. Um, it just came out a couple days ago in Jacobin titled Rich People Are Fueling Climate Catastrophe, but not mostly because of their consumption. I did a poor job at the beginning of actually introducing your bio that Matt is an assistant professor of geography at Syracuse University. Um, he's also the author of Lifeblood, Oil Freedom and the Forces of Capital as well as this other catalyst, he's written several catalyst pieces and both of them are very good. Um, and uh, But the most recent one is Still No Shortcuts for Climate Change. And it's an assessment of the, I would say the last decade or so, basically since the Obama era, um, how both liberals and the left have approached climate change and, and kind of where, um, so, so you know, where the left has gotten stuck in the last few years and, and kind of where we need to be focused right now if we are to actually tackle the, the momentous size of the problem that's in front of us, which it's sometimes I think difficult to wrap our heads around just how big the problem is. And, yeah. um, and so insofar as we are many, I know many people who are frantically trying to figure out how to do something to, to deal with climate change as political organizers, it's still, there's still so much more that we need to be focused on. And, and, um, and part of it is we just need uh, greater people power, like in the mm -hmm. sense of like more people should be like organizing around this. Yes. Um, but thank you again, Matt. Uh, thanks for spending 40 minutes with me yeah, on a me. Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> um, if you're watching, please hit like, please hit subscribe, um, please share us, uh, maybe share us with someone who, uh, <laughs> you know, is not quite on the left on these issues yet. Maybe share with someone who is on the left and and um, could use Matt's wisdom on this question. Um, but thank you all for watching. Again, thank you, Matt. And uh, I'll see you very soon. Take Have care. a good night.